thank you everybody for coming to this panel on access rights as a tool for activism. Uh, we have three speakers uh, to, uh, to, to speak about this topic. Just as a little bit of background, uh, for a long time we have in Europe data protection laws uh, that have been revised with the general data protection regulation and uh, one really important part of data protection laws is uh, so-called so data subject rights, rights uh, that are granted to people um, uh, with, respect, with respect to their personal data. Um, one of the most basic data subject rights is the right to access personal data. It's also a part uh, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights that has a separate right to the protection of personal data. So it's really elevated to like a human right, fundamental right level in Europe. And the access rights is there specifically uh, in the Charter. And, um, and these access rights are interesting in many ways. There's been a lot of use of these access rights in history. Uh, but especially, I think, in the last, maybe, let's say, five years, we see a growing use of these rights um, uh, in very interesting ways uh, by activists and by digital rights organizations. So this is a panel where we want to talk about the use of these access rights uh, for activism, for different types of activism, uh, and ask some questions about that. Uh, we have um, uh, three uh, amazing panelists. Uh, our first speaker is Gaetan Goldberg, who is working for uh, None of Your Business, NY, uh, NOYB, uh, based in Austria. Um, the organization that was uh, started by SREMS uh, a few years back. Um, our uh, second speaker is Karolina Ivanska, that works for the Panopticon Foundation in Poland. Um, and uh, third speaker is uh, René Mailleux, who is a uh, PhD candidate at uh, the LSTS group at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels, that is also the organizer of, of the CPDB conference and, and co-organizer of, of, of this event. Um, what we will do is we will kick off this session with a number of opening remarks from the uh, speakers, um, uh, but we will keep it relatively brief because what we would like to do is that to have as much um, uh, conversation and interaction with you as an audience. Uh, so I imagine uh, that not everybody, some of you may be very, very familiar with uh, the right to access, with the GDPR, with data protection law. Some of you may not be familiar at all. So a first question that I would have for you as an audience, who is uh, very familiar with access rights already and is considers themselves a little bit of a specialist? So there's a, f there's a few of you there. Uh, who is uh, actually not at all a, uh, uh, familiar or like not knowledgeable about um, uh, data protection, access rights. There's also some of you in the room. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. So just to just to clarify uh, as an introduction, and I have now like this is the o o main reason I was putting some slides. So this is this is the right of access granted to the data subject. So. Just to read the first bit, the data subject shall have the right to obtain from the controller. The controller is the organization, the entity that is dealing, collecting, and using personal data of people. Uh, so you can ask the controller confirmation as to whether or not personal data concer concerning you is being processed. And where that is the case, access to the personal data. So that is like a first basic thing you can you can ask access to the personal data that is being processed by an organization. And then on top of that, you can ask all sorts of information about that processing. So what are the purposes of that information relating to you being processed? What are the categories of personal data concerned? And for instance, what are the third parties? What are the other organizations or entities that are give, getting access to that information? So all these types of questions you can put into an access request. And then there's a uh, stipulated procedure and also with time uh, limits uh, under which like the controller, this organization has to respond uh, to that uh, request. Uh, so, um, and then, you know, if they're not responding, you can make a complaint to a supervisory authority. You can ultimately also go to court. So this is like it's a legal right in the same way that you may know of freedom of information requests, you know, that you can file to get access to government information. You have these data rights, these access rights to get access to personal data. Just a final bit to clarify uh, for those that you're not so familiar with uh, data protection. 
Data protection is a framework that applies to the processing of personal data. So processing is anything you can do with personal data, any kind of <laughs> thing you can do with information, combining it, uh, analyzing it, or sharing it with others. Uh, but the, the really important bit is, of course, what counts as personal data? Uh, so I'm not going to give a lecture on this. This is a very interesting topic. But for now, it uh, is important, I think, or enough for you to know that this is a very broad uh, concept in Europe. It, is, it goes far beyond what in the US, for instance, is called personal identifiable information. It goes far beyond identifiers, it's all sorts of information that relates to an identifiable sub, uh, person. And the person, uh, it's enough for the person to be identifiable. That identif identifiability can even happen on the basis of information that the controller doesn't have itself. You know, it could be that another organization has information that can, al can allow identification. So it's just like, so important to know that this is a very broad uh, category of data and with all these individua individualized ways that we deal with uh, technology, um, there tends to be a lot of personal data that are being processed in digital uh, environments. Okay, so with that, I think I went through my uh, intro and I'm going to give the floor for opening remarks uh, first by Gaetan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce, for this very insightful introduction. So I don't know if some of you, all of you are familiar with now as an organization. We, we basically engage in the representation of data subjects before data protection authorities, and we do so thanks to Article 80 of the, of the GDPR. So access requests are actually quite essential to what we do on a, on a daily basis. We use them when we investigate a company. Why? Because you know your data is being processed by that company, and you can access the privacy policy of that company, but what you often don't know is, you know, to what extent processing operations are taking place. And, how do you compare the information you can read in a privacy policy to um, the information, what's really happening with your data? So what we do is we ask people to send subject access requests to companies, and then we compare the answer they receive from those access requests, when answer there is, um, to what the company is stating, both in its privacy policy, but also in its marketing material that the company is you know, sending to, to businesses. And, and astonishingly, um, we usually observe like a number of differences. If I take the very basic example of you know, storage limitation, which is you know, how long a company is storing your personal data for, um, it's quite regular that we observe in a privacy policy that the company says, for instance, you know, we're going to keep your data for one year. And then in the data we observed that some of the data was kept for over five years. And then, well, that's an infringement of the principle of storage limitation. And in that regard, access requests are a fabulous tool to you know, kind of assess not only um, the compliance of the company with Article 15, but also with a number of GDPR principles. Um, and so we take the answers, we look at um, you know, what's contained in them, and then we assess whether we have a case or not, and if we should engage in the representation of an individual before a data protection authority. Um, so in a way, theoretically, access requests are an excellent um, evidence gathering tool. But then are they actually working? And so that's, we had a test case last year in January 2019. Um, we filed complaints against eight streaming services that you're most likely familiar with, ranging from Netflix to Spotify. Where, so we basically made subject access requests and we waited for the results. And we were waiting for companies to fulfill all of these elements, meaning, you know, is the data being processed? Am, am I being Am I receiving the information of like, you know, which third party commercial partners is, is getting my information and so forth and so on. And none of the company actually fully complied with it. We filed eight complaints. So on, on the 18th of January last year, we still don't have a result yet. We're hoping for decisions to come up from the different um, data protection authorities that are concerned. But so what did we actually observe are observations that we are still making on a daily basis when we file such access request, such as the fact that some companies did not even bother answering. It's only from the moment that, you know, the media started talking about the fact that, you know, there was a complaint directly against SoundCloud, which is a music streaming service, and then we finally received some supplementary information from them. And also, you know, regarding time, when you look at this article, you might think, oh, it's quite practical. I'm just going to send my exit request and they're just going to provide me with all the elements I'm entitled to. The reality is quite more complex. You have a lot of back and forth with the controllers, so the companies, until you finally obtain the information you're looking for, if you're getting the information as a whole. Then we also observe that 
the data sets we were receiving were oftentimes not really understandable. We were not provided with the tools that are really necessary to kind of understand what was contained in the file. You would have a, a, like numerous numbers of like, what are those, you know, are those GPS coordinates, are those different? Um, and also some companies are using download tools. Um, I'm thinking of Google specifically, I'm telling you, you know, you might download your data, but does this really fulfill Article 15 of the GDPR? Oftentimes not, and Google is they're themselves claiming that, you know, using the tool does not amount to exercising your rights under Article 15 of the GDPR. So overall, I think subject access requests are really, ideally a really great tool, but we're really waiting on, on enforcement on our side. So I'm gonna give the floor to Carolina. Thank you. So from Panopticon's perspective, we are an organization that does engage in litigation in legal cases, but very often uh, we use access requests not with that purpose, that is more, uh, more often a result uh, of, of really investigating not an individual company, but the entire industry, for example. And we are really interested in the, the power and the influence that governments and uh, companies have on our lives, on our decisions. So what we usually ask for in our access requests, like uh, Joris mentioned, um, uh, personal data is a very broad concept. It's not only your name, it's not only your uh, email, it's not only the data that you yourself provide uh, to the data controller, but it's also the interpretations that this controller makes, uh, makes about you on the basis of that data. So for example, w um, what does it mean that you know, I've been spotted by the controller in that place several times? What, did they, what assumptions did they come to? Did they qualify me uh, as, a, as a female, as a male? Did they qualify me as interested in something? And so we are very interested in this, in this layer of information about us. Behavioral profiles, uh, marketing profiles, call it, call it what you like, but I think you, you know what I mean. Uh, we, we are interested in interpretations. And so in these, um, s and so we tested access requests in two uh, contexts. One is advertising, and the other one is um, banking credit, credit scoring. And so um, in these, uh, in banking it's more straightforward because usually you know you provide your name, you provide your address and so on, and this is quite easy to identify you as a data subject. But when it comes to advertising, very often online, you do not identify yourself with your name. You identify yourself with a cookie uh, that was installed in your computer. You identify yourself with an IP address. There's no name uh, that is, a, that is a th th there is no, no um, direct information that you, that you might have. And this causes sometimes a lot of problems. I get already mentioned you enter into a constant back and forth. Is it your cookie? Is it for sure your cookie? Is, it, is this computer not shared with someone else? Um, prove it to me. And I feel like the only way to, of proving that is actually going to that company with your computer and doing it in front of them. Because sometimes um, companies come up with quite absurd uh, excuses uh, of not giving you access to that information because obviously this is quite this is very valuable information. This is some kind of know-how that they have, um, how they profile people, for example, how they make judgments about people, and they n are not very likely to disclose that. Um, but I started already talking a bit about obstacles, but I also wanted to talk a bit more about the why we are doing this access request in the first place. So I already mentioned that we are in, um, doing that for investigative purposes. So we want to see uh, like Gethan also mentioned, we want to see what is actually going on there uh, in that company, for example, with our data. How are we being profiled? If we are told by these companies that they are personalizing advertisements, for example, or that they are profiling us, we have the right to know how they profiled us in order to, for example, correct that information. If they, I don't know, on the basis of my browsing history, they decide that I'm a man, I can tell them, no, I'm a woman. I want to see, I don't know, ads for women, or, <laughs> or if there is something like that. But you know, it, there is, it's, uh, there's something about transparency and control involved. Um, very verifying your assumptions about the, because sometimes you, you hear that this profiling is so deep. You know, it, it touches on your illnesses. It touches on your political affiliations. So very often we file this uh, access request to verify whether this is really taking place. 
But then again, we, we I think we'll also discuss it later in more detail. How do you make sure that the response that you receive is complete? There's no way, you, you cannot go to this company, you cannot look into their servers, you don't know if this is exact, uh, if they re revealed complete, complete information. And very often, I think it's also useful, uh, important to mention, that we are filing access requests to even educate companies themselves. Because sometimes they, um, uh, to give you an example, I did a couple of access requests to companies who uploaded my data, my email address, for example, to Facebook. This is called custom audience, and companies, for example, if you subs subscribe to a newsletter at Zalando, I don't know, or another shop, or s somewhere else, um, they might upload this information to Facebook in order to target ads on Facebook. So Facebook matches this email to the Facebook user, and then uh, this advertiser will be able to show you ads on Facebook and not on, on their own platform. And so I wrote to these companies with that uh, goal, asking them um, whether you shared my, I want to have access to my information inform and uh, information about who you shared my data with. And I already knew that they shared it with Facebook, but I wanted to see whether they are going to tell me that they shared it with Facebook. And in fact, no one, none of the companies did. And when I specifically mentioned what I meant, because I assumed that they were not hiding it in a deliberative way, they maybe were ignorant about that, it really did turn out that they didn't even consider that that might be something that, you know, that is subject to access requests, that that might even be something that they should disclose in their privacy policies, uh, that this is something that people might even care about. So this this aspect of, of educating companies is also quite quite important and of ultimately changing their practices. Because I think we also uh, sometimes judge some of the companies quite, quite harshly when they do not reply or when they reply in a way that doesn't satisfy us. But perhaps we sometimes forget that this, our access request probably lands up, lands at the desk, not of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, but of like a random employee who's a low level uh, employee who might not it's not a justification, it's not really an excuse, but who might not even be able to, to answer you, might not be well equipped to answer you. And we saw that in the credit score um, cases when we asked some banks about how they, there is a, there's a new law in Poland, I'm not going to get into detail, but, but the, 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 the employee who received that access request called us because they simply didn't know uh, what we were talking about. So I think it's also useful to, to know that sometimes giving more information, more detail could be useful. J just a little anecdote on that in between. It's like from, from what I've heard, uh, uh, Max Rams, who's quite famous, of course, for the work he did on, on, uh, on data protection and compliance, um, he started his activism with his campaign on uh, Europe versus Facebook. And, and one of the main key components of that of that campaign launching was a big access request to Facebook um, that Facebook uh, replied with with sending like a PDF of around thousand document thousand pages I think that then uh, that uh, uh, Max analyzed and um, but the thing is that I heard later on that I mean there's really a there's of course all sorts of strategies that companies use to to reply to access requests and I think what happened in this case uh, is that uh, later on the company was really not so happy in the way that like an employee had uh, basically tried to answer it in relatively good faith uh, to this request and ended up sending a lot of information that then like really kicked off uh, the campaign because it revealed all sorts of very problematic legal issues around like uh, the creation of shadow profiles and things like that. So it is like it, it there in some way the, um, the, the it goes both ways. There are situations where you would really wish people in companies to have the space to faithfully reply to these uh, kinds of uh, requests. But then uh, like over time also companies coming with much more sophisticated legal uh, strategies that put a lot of hurdles and 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 make a lot yeah that is more top down kind of preventing from yeah information also leaking about like what is happening within uh, within the company. Rene, like I'll give the floor to you. Thank you. Um, yes, as um, you also already said, I am doing a PhD uh, on actually the right of access to personal data, 
And in, in particular, I'm asking myself the question, is the right of access um, effective in practice? Uh, so I look at it from a, uh, um, from a legal perspective, of course, looking at the law, looking at case law, but also really how is it used in society and how is it used by organizations such as Panopticon and, uh, and NOIP. Um, so I started out two years ago with doing some empirical research where I, with some people we sent over 100 access requests to different companies that was all in the Netherlands just to get a first feel, just to see how, uh, how this right actually works, just because I wanted to know from first-hand experience. And indeed, what we've already heard from the other speakers is I think initially around half of the companies just didn't respond at all. Then if you send some reminder or you, 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 you ask again, it, it goes up a bit. Um, in particular also, companies might respond with very clear personal data. So they might say, oh, we have your name, we have your email address, you have your phone number, uh, but that might not be the most sensitive or interesting information. You are already aware that, that they have that kind of data. Um, so we also ask in access requests, uh, with whom did you share that data? Or if not from me, did you actually get data about me from others? And there you really see that maybe in our research, like only 10, 15% of organizations um, uh, respond to this kind of question, more detailed questions. Um, so that, that leaves maybe on first, uh, for first point of view, you think that, okay, this, this, this right is horrible. It doesn't, it doesn't work at all. Uh, but then, if I talk with people who use this right, it's not that simple. Actually, everyone says, well, it is true on the one hand that compliance is really problematic, uh, but on the other hand, that does absolutely not mean that the right, uh, that the right is useless. It's, it's just useless, uh, useful and maybe in a different way. Um, so that's what I'm now looking at most. It's like, in which context is it useful? Like, in, under which circumstances? And for which purposes? So, looking from a data perspective, uh, protection uh, perspective and uh, also a uh, historical perspective on data protection. We, I mean, we have now the GDPR, which w went into effect in 2018, which gave a lot of more public attention to digital rights uh, in general and to communities like these. But actually, we have data protection uh, rights since the 70s uh, and, and discussions about data rights uh, already since the 60s. And in some sense, it's really interesting that there is a huge continuity there. So the right of access was already discussed about in the 60s and was already made into law uh, also at the beginning of the 70s. And also in many European countries, it started to be there in the 70s, 80s. Then Data Protection Directive also already had the right of access. So it's really a long-standing uh, uh, right. And I think in general, I mean, there are a lot of points of view, but it's to, to combat informational power disbalance. So someone has data about you, you don't have it, and that is in itself maybe unfair, or like the idea that when there's information about you, you have to have the right to know about that, uh, to kind of create a level playing field. Um, and what you then see is that the right of access actually is used by digital rights organizations, so, uh, uh, such as we just heard, but it's also uh, used in a lot of other contexts. Um, so, for example, uh, for labor rights, you now see uh, that uh, Uber drivers are using the right of access to get information about what, what does Uber actually know about them, like when do they log into the app, uh, when do they log out? How many hours have they actually worked in a day? And does that amount of hours of work per day uh, fit with the labor laws? Uh, they can use that kind of knowledge uh, data uh, to compute if they are uh, getting minimum wage uh, and that kind of uh, things. So you see that actually new uh, labor unions are being uh, started and old existing labor unions are starting to use this right in order to fight for other fundamental rights, which are in, in essence not digital rights, but they use this, the, the, since the world is more and more digitalized, actually non-digital rights become by themselves digital rights. Uh, similar with uh, consumer rights. In the Netherlands, there was a huge case uh, of consumers against uh, insurance companies, where insurance companies had, bought, uh, had sold um, uh, financial products which were very problematic, 
uh, and they had basically not informed consumers uh, fairly about what kind of pr uh, um, products they were buying, but it was very hard for the consumers to prove that they didn't hadn't received the right information. And then with the help of the right of access, they could uh, ask for recordings of the phone conversations that they had had uh, with, uh, with those uh, insurance companies years before. So you might have all experienced this. Sometimes when you call a company, the company says, uh, this, uh, this uh, telephone call is being recorded. Uh, for often they say, we'll say for training purposes or something. Uh, but the reality is that it's mostly also for them to have actually something to be per potentially use in court against you. And since a phone recording uh, with your voice is also, and that was went up to the Supreme Court in the Netherlands, uh, considered in itself personal data, uh, those consumers had the right to access that and then could actually use it against the insurance company to prove that they had not given uh, proper information. Um, so what we have heard too is that from these experience, and also if you look at most, in my personal experience, and also in most um, court cases, you see access is not easily given. Like the ideal is, of course, you have this right of access as we had on the screen. You send a request, by, uh, you send an email, and then you know, uh, one or two weeks, or the law says within four weeks, you, you get an answer and you have what you want. The reality is almost always not like that. And there, I think what is interesting is that there is now this, what I call an ecology of transparency. There's a context, there are groups, there are circumstances in which transparency, uh, transparency can be brought. So to give an example of that, when I do an access request, I might not receive an answer. But if I at the same time have a journalist next to me, and the journalist sends an access request or sends a second letter and says, hey, I'm a journalist and I'm doing a, a, an article about this, you see that all of a sudden um, the response of the organization might change a lot. Uh, same is probably sometimes true, I hope, uh, for these digital rights organizations. When the organization that gets an access request knows that there might be a consequence uh, in not answering uh, fully, they might start to behave uh, differently. Or as has been said, if I do an access request on my own, I might not know what to expect or what, what are my rights completely. But when I can call NOIP and ask them as specialists, hey, I received this response, is it okay? Uh, what kind of rights do I have? My, I, I, I can get empowered. So there is this context that is necessary uh, to make the right of access work. And we see, I hope, uh, a bit of a movement uh, or this context being created at, the, at this moment. Can I add two words? Yeah. I just wanted to add two words on two points. Um, one, that Rana mentioned that so sometimes that you might think that access requests are not working, but sometimes that is actually maybe useful that they are not working, which was actually the case when we were investigating the advertising industry. We realized that there was no one standard of replying to, to, to access requests. Most of the companies didn't even bother to respond. Some of them, you know, said that we have to provide proof of ID. Some of them said that we have to... I don't know, provide some screenshots so you could see that there was no one standard while th in, pract in, uh, you know, in theory the law should be applied in the same way, in the, at least in the same uh, uh, industry that is not, uh, among companies that are not very different from each other. And that was uh, a crucial argument, like this lack of standards and lack of transparency was a crucial argument in complaints that we filed against, uh, against uh, the, the organizers of this, of this industry, against Google and Indo uh, uh, Internet Advertising Bureau, saying that, look, that there is something seriously broken with how this system has been designed if I am identified by, by these companies. I am uh, shown personal ads, but I cannot ha have access to them for some, for some reason. And, and then, so, that, so that's kind of a blessing in disguise that these, these access requests didn't work because it, it helps prove a point that there is something wrong with an entire way that data is processed. And the second, the second thing is also about, um, you know, when you receive a response but you're not sure uh, whether it's complete, whether it's not complete, 
this is what this is why it's very it's useful to challenge this this company a little bit and for example present them with uh, like get mentioned with their marketing materials like if they are boasting uh, you know uh, for their clients that they are able to do super targeted profiling like one of the polish banks but when they respond with an access uh, to an access request and they only mention that they have my address and uh, account number and the fact that i have scheduled a payment for every month then there's something wrong so are you is this marketing a hoax or like are you really doing that so so challenging them but it's uh, it's, it's a back and forth but i think it's worth engaging in in it great thank you so i i have a lot of questions but i want to give an opportunity right away to uh to questions from the audience anybody has questions already or other perspectives that you would like to add please and i will repeat the question so that uh, ah, there, ah, there's an actual microphone. Great. Um, <coughs> I just wondered if anybody had any observations on um, reliance on the Article 23 GDPR right to um, restrict um, responses to subject access requests. Um, I have in mind, particularly when you're asking government uh, departments for uh, your data and um, you are told or sometimes you're not told uh, that the department has uh, not given you all your, all your data. For example, maybe you've asked the police for surveillance information and they don't give you all of that surveillance information relying on the restrictions in Article 23. Um, have you encountered uh, use of those restrictions by government departments I in your work and do you have any tips on um, how to get around those or argue back um, in order to maximize the, the data that you get back? Maybe, maybe just to broaden, uh, broaden that question a bit, what are the types of legal arguments that you do hear to restrict giving access? I mean, there I've heard quite a lot of maybe more practical things, and but like I mean, there could be legal arguments. I think about identification. We don't know that it's you, or but like maybe say, li or this is not personal data, or. Um, yeah, yeah. Just t t uh, two short uh, points there that. In first instance, uh, it was actually quite shocking to find out how little justification you get for anything. Uh, so often, the response is clearly limited, but there is no real, real legal argumentation provided or as to why it is limited. And, and the second point that, uh, that I, uh, I want to make, and also it's a question if, uh, that I have to you, um, is that I found that g in general, um, public organizations respond a bit differently to access requests in the sense that I have the feeling that there is often mu a much higher willingness at least to engage outside of court, like to really say, well, this is our initial answer, let's say, but you can come by to our office and we can discuss what are actually the limits or that there is a legitimate uh, right to get more. Uh, so I've had personally this kind of experience, for example, with the tax authorities uh, who said, well, we have really a lot of uh, information. Uh, you can go to this law, which this law explains why we have access or gives us by law the legal right to access that information. It's too much for uh, to give everything, but you can come by and then you can ask very specific questions. And indeed I could. And similarly with the police, who first gave me a rather limited answer, but at the same time directly told me that I could uh, come by, uh, p uh, pass by, and then have a more face-to-face -face kind of almost life um, negotiation, uh, but with a clear intuition that they knew that there was a kind of a citizen's right to, to know what the government is doing with your data, which I've never really felt with companies. So, so to, to reflect on that, basically, um we mostly engage with corporations, but one should remember that under Article 12, controllers must facilitate the exercise of data subject rights, and the right to access is, is one of those. Um, and then there are several tensions that we could observe. For instance, if you try to obtain 
an explanation as to what type of profiling is being carried on. They oftentimes tell you, well, you know, this is our IP property, these are all algorithms and these are values, so we're not going to give you that information that easily. And so it's, it's, it truly is an ongoing fight, um, no matter whether it's a private or a public actor. I just wanted to comment maybe on the on the police uh, part. Um, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when it comes to law enforcement, GDPR doesn't uh, apply. We have the law enforcement directive that regulates what kind of information you can access and what you can add. And as it's a directive, it has to be implemented in every country, which Poland did terribly. And um, so, so, so basically, we don't have access to any information. But when outside of uh, law enforcement, other government bodies, you know, uh, should respond to access requests under under GDPR. So tax authorities, uh, hospitals, schools, like any any public body that is not law enforcement, uh, should not come up with uh, with arguments of uh, you know national security or or ongoing investigations. But but others, I th I think they have the right to do so under the the law enforcement directive and and. It probably has to be challenged uh, in in court uh, if they if they if they reply uh, and they don't have really justification of denying you access. Okay, a quick reaction. Right? Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you for that. Uh, you you. I, I agree that um, commercial bodies have a lot less scope to rely on those exemptions than public authorities. That I I think it. You're right. Also, the the police. Um, come under the law enforcement directive. The, uh, the key point that I've found in doing this is that other than uh, where that um, criminal investigation or nas national security justification is being relied on, you do at least have a right to be told that the information you've been given has been restricted. So you can at least start, start the arguments that you're talking about then. It's just in those areas where you're not, you, you don't have an entitlement to be told that. So, so you're actually also saying that the fact that this restriction is being invoked is itself a very interesting piece of information to get. You, you may, may be actually looking for that. No, okay, I see. Shall we get the next question? Please. Hi. Um, do you have any um, easily accessible resources uh, for the public as to how to actually file for a question for your own personal information? Because I would love to file some requests myself or help some people file their requests, but I have no clue as to where to start. And then maybe also, and the question is like, yeah, do you need, do you need to be an expert to, to do this effectively or what kind of expert and, yeah. So it's actually fairly easy um, and there are plenty of tools out there to help you file such requests. I think of a partner organization that's probably in the room somewhere called Bits of Freedom that launched a tool called My Data Don't Write, which is, it's mydatadonwrite.eu um, you have a form, you just fill in your personal information and then it, it drafts a letter for you to, to a controller and then, you know, depending whether they're responding or not, then your second step could be to reach out to us and then we might help you file a complaint. Yeah, I, I, w I wanted to say indeed, it, like um, Bits of Freedom has actually, in the Netherlands, has been done, done this, uh, I, I don't know how long exactly, but re I think almost maybe 10 years ago that, that the first uh, platform came online to help uh, like people to, to do access requests. And, and there's this, there's this, so initially it's, e it's easy, and especially under the GDPR, uh, the rights became, really became better. For example, including that if you have normally digital communications with a certain organization, then they must also accept an access request digitally. Whereas previously they might have tried to say, oh, you have to send a letter, which especially to young people who might never have sent a letter in their life, is can be a really, <laughs> uh, really big obstacle. So that's one thing. But then indeed, in the, the nego like, if you wanna go further than just the first response, then it really, becomes a sphere of contestation and then you you might need help uh, or it is helpful to get help from people who have been there before but then indeed organizations like NOIP uh, who, who uh, so none of your business uh, uh, they uh, they provide this help because they have this super long history of uh, of doing this request so they know how to, well relatively to any other organizations you do <laughs> uh, so so they they, they might ha have kind of uh, standard responses uh, to standard modes of objecting 
I think there are also uh, two strategies when it comes to filing access requests. One is, uh, and I heard uh, that Max Rams does it this way, hi, I'm Max Rams, give me all my data. <laughs> Uh, dot or there's a there's a strategy that is more um, that, that you know that you ask for particular pieces of information like for example hello this is my these are my identifiers I want only the information about the the I don't know the companies that you share it with so there are two strategies either you want to go wide or you want to go narrow and then maybe go go wider um, yeah but I think both are try worth trying to, to yeah trying out. Precisely, plus depending on the kind of services you're dealing with, you might ask for specific types of information. For instance, if you're going after a fitness like app company or dating app, you might ask for localization, while for others you might ask for other specific forms of information, such as you know, how long are they going to store my data for, such things. Um, may I ask a question uh, regarding season, season's filing uh, requests? Uh, how this would uh, work for health data, for instance, access to health data? Uh, what how, do, how do access requests work in the health context, in like with respect to in like hospitals, doctors? I mean, just like what I know about this context is that like access to medical records has typically also its own set of regulations and norms. Mm -hmm. You know, so that 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 can sometimes can be a little bit of a parallel leg legal situation. Yes, yes, exactly. At least in Poland, like there is a co complete separate system of uh, accessing your medical files like in pe and also because this data is so sensitive it probably ha there are like m more restrictions on how you can access them for example you have to go in person to the hospital or provide ID while in other circumstances it would be excessive to ask for your, your ID for example yeah um, in, indeed that's also uh, my experience is that in different contexts the, the experience or the history might be very different. Um, so for example, uh, the right of access in, in the realm of social security already existed before we had the right of access because actually that, then already in the 50s and the 60s, there was a specific right to access social security related information. And I think uh, similarly for, uh, for the healthcare industry, there might be a lot of historical um, background in the kind of ethics that is involved in the relationship between the patient and, uh, and the caregiver. Uh, and in that, uh, in that context, I also noticed in a, in, a, in a personal request that I did that uh, my doctor was almost, I, it, I felt that it was almost like kind of angry or it felt that they, that, that, that my doctor felt that, be, that my doing an access request felt like, oh, do you not trust me or something? which was not the case at all, but it had really to do with the type of relationship uh, that we had. But as far as we know, or as I know, I'm not sure if I'm wrong, in principle, the GDPR does apply, uh, but the uh, data controller, so in this case, the, the doctor or the hospital, has also the obligation to provide access in a safe way. And in that sense, the more uh, uh, um, uh, risky or the, the more, um, uh, how to say that? Uh, sensitive the data is, the more care they have to take to be sure that it, it's, it's given under the right uh, context. And indeed, that can be done by asking you to, to come to the hospital or to the doctor and to see it in the space so that they can check, for example, your ID and be sure that they really give it to you and not to someone else. Thank you very much. We have two questions here. Shall I take them in a row? Yep. Well, my question is quite related um, to what has been business, in fact, <coughs> on, a, on a few GDP requests I made, uh, the company said, uh, please, can you send us a copy of your ID so we can keep processing? And the last thing I want to do is to send them more, more personal information. So uh, did, you did you have this issue and do you have, wha how did you solve it? Did you manage to solve it? Um, I, I would be interested in how you would approach planning a more large-scale data, uh, data access request campaign with maybe 200 subjects that have been under investigation by governmental authorities, multiple governmental authorities, and you want to find out how this data is being shared, what it is used for. So I'm, I'm very interested in how you would approach that. So uh, 
I've actually seen two of you talking about access requests, but also saying um, that, um, for example, Max Schrem said, uh, please give me all my data. And one of you saying, oh, um, there's like this place that you can go to and download, download your data. But uh, I actually want to get clarification on that because an access request for me is uh, a series of questions that you make to a company, and then they give you a series of answers. And there's a problem right there, I think, that uh, the, these questions are not so specific, and then you get incomplete information. For example, in the first uh, sentence of the Article 15, I think, um, they say uh, what categories of personal data they collect. And this is a problem because then you don't know the data points itself themselves. But so this is my first question. Uh, there is a difference, right, between an access request and a portability request, and then because I want to know what I should expect from a, com from a, a company. Also, my second question would be, um, I think that Article 15 is not super specific into uh, what a company should describe of their processing. I think also that a company can refrain from telling you what types of processors they engage. Um, and so you do not know what type of other companies or what other companies have your data. So you can't, you're basically, like uh, you cannot proceed with your uh, with your rights because you cannot know where your data is and uh, to what companies ask to ask for like access requests or deletion requests or and so on. Oh, okay. Maybe you address these ones and then we continue. Mm -hmm. um, so, with regards to the first uh, question about identification, there is actually. Um, well, I, I just published a paper with some colleagues uh, getting data subject rights right, which was in a discussion with the EVPB, the European Data Protection Board, about all these kind of questions around data subject rights. And one of the most important was what about identification? Uh, because a lot of people feel like you do, like why should I send this company a copy of my passport? Well, that is clearly not information that they have. And often, it's also not information that is actually useful for them to be sure that you are you. Because if, um, if you're asking a company that, for example, only has a cookie ID to know who you are, then they previously might really not have yet known what is your name or what's your photo or your birth date. So you're actually really giving them more information. Um, like the, I would say that the most realistic interpretation of the law is that they should verify that they give it to the correct person, which does not have to mean that they have to know who you are. They have to just have to be able to say, this is the same person as we have data about. So they might have an email address of me, and they might be able to check, oh, this is coming from the same email address, and therefore it's probably the same person, without actually knowing who that email address belongs to. But especially previously, when the, there's a quite a big problem of there being different um, interpretations by different data protection authorities. So there were guidelines by some data protection authorities that actually told companies you should ask for a government ID, while there were others saying, oh, you should not do that. And l luck, one of the potential cons consequences of the GDPR is that this is going to be more uh, more one rule for the whole of Europe, but we're clearly not yet there. To reflect on the, the ID um, requests, um, I think a quick fix we've used in the past was to simply heavily redact um, the ID we would send, just leaving the first name and the last name so as to be identifiable. But that was really, you know, we're trying to find other ways. <laughs> um, then to, to move on to the next question on the, the large scale access requests from government authorities, um, that's Unfortunately, not something my organization engages in, but um, if it were to concern private corporations, though, we'd have interest doing that. Um, and, and I'd strongly um, invite you to get in touch with us um, because it's, for us, it's always really interesting to have like um, a pool of data subjects looking towards the same direction. I believe um, there was experience in the Netherlands as well when it comes to filing um, access requests simultaneously against a, a single controller and, and, and practices tend to move um, wh when people do so. Then on the, on the third question, um, I think I quite agree with you. I think Article 15 is, is, <laughs> is what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite blurry and it's, it's not really precise and, and a category of personal data is, is not precise at all. I think when it comes to the, 
um, the recipients or the categories of recipients, this is an area where you know, scholars oftentimes disagree. You have people saying, if you can you know, specifically identify a specific company you're sending that data to, that company should be named in the answer to the, to the subject access request. And, and it's often the case that even if they have the identity, they won't provide you with it because they'll just say either, oh, we, sh we share it with you know, our commercial partners and sometimes just won't even disclose that piece of information. Um, and when it comes to access and portability, it's true that there's, there's a clear, there's a thin line with companies kind of blurring, um, am I getting access to my personal data or is this, am I getting a file that I get to use as exercising my right to portability? And this is something we've experienced mostly with um, download tools because usually they're like, you know, you can access your data, but what am I using th this data for? And, and that's also something like I was saying early on, um, when we tried and when we filed a complaint against YouTube, um, we found out that Google was saying, you know, this download tool that we redirect you to when you're asking for your data, well, basically, it's, it's not there for you to exercise your right under Article 15, but they also didn't say it's there for you to exercise your right to data portability. So what is it there for? You know, like, we don't know. So I guess time will tell. Okay, I also will add a couple of comments to these questions. Uh, when it comes to the ID, um, especially in the environment that Rana mentioned, when you don't identify yourself with your name, like, at the, at the, at the, you can think like, what change does the ID make? Like now, can they, now that does it change significantly whether it's you or whether it's you? Like the only risk-free uh, way of identifying you is, as I mentioned, going to them with your computer. Um, but uh, so, 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 some, so what we are trying to do in such cases is to, uh, to, to work towards a standard that you're, if you're, uh, you're asking for, for information and you, for example, enclose, I don't know, some kind of signed, um, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, some kind of signed claim that this is my computer, I am the sole user of, of that computer, that should be enough. Especially that... I mean, revealing information related to cookies is usually not it's usually not sensitive information. It's not health data. So even if they reveal it accidentally to someone who, for some weird reason, downloaded your cookies from your computer and wants to find out something about these cookies, I don't know what why anybody would do that. But uh, but the risk of um, like the risk is not that big. I mean, even if. Like, I think there is a bigger risk in, in, you know, a priori not disclosing that data ever to, to people who are perfectly identifiable um, than, you know, revealing some not sensitive information to, uh, um, to the wrong person. When it comes to the bigger campaigns, uh, we also don't do that. I think it's super difficult to coordinate that. But there are uh, organizations in the Edry network who have tried that before, like La Quadrature du Net, uh, as far as I know. But they also tried with, uh, with, uh, with corporations. I'm not sure about governments, whether that has been done. You know? Um, yes, I, I, I know just from the research context that there is, there is a pretty uh, substantial issue with that. That's um, it might be very useful to do very many access requests with different uh, different data subjects, especially also because you can learn a lot from the differences. But obviously, when you would do that, you would be dealing yourself also with very big amounts of personal data. Uh, so actually, to 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 get a framework of consent or of limited or uh, data sharing, which made it makes it possible to for a big group of people to work together without them sharing information that they might not be willing uh, to share uh, is, is quite, a, uh, quite a big issue uh, in that. Mm -hmm. So I found also that I did a part of my research with data subjects that were not themselves researchers. Uh, and then it was possible by doing it with a very limited number of people uh, and having quite very clear and detailed explanations of what we were gonna do with the data under which conditions. But in general, you see that most researchers, and also I hear that similar at NGOs, often NGOs do complaints with actually their own em like employees. And researchers often do access requests themselves because then they can easily say, oh, I consented to, do, to doing this. And when you're involving other people, that becomes much more sensitive. Yeah, that, that, uh, that, that's a good to add. There's, uh, there's experience in Germany with a la rather large campaign that was like a non-existing community. Uh, it was opened to the German population, basically. 
uh, there was the Shufa, Shufa uh, campaign, the Open Shufa campaign. So that is an interesting one to look at. They they ran into also some significant issues with respect to data protection compliance themselves. Uh, this campaign, uh, the goal was to get as much information as possible about the data feeding into Shufa, like credit scores. This is the Shufa um, organization is doing credit scoring in Germany. And then uh, their main goal or one of their main uh, claims was that they would kind of try to use this data to reverse engineer the, uh, the particular scoring algorithm that was being used and also to look into uh, pot potential data-driven discrimination issues uh, that may be uh, happening in this context, which is, of course, a concern that in the whole algorithmic governance uh, discussion is quite prominent that, that the use of data, uh, relying on data for evaluating uh, claims and making decisions is leading to d uh, new forms of, uh, of discrimination. And only to add on the, on the last question, when... Um Article, f I think it's important to make a distinction between access right from Article 15 and the right to information, general information from Article 13 and 14 GDPR, and that Article 15 applies to you individually. Like, for example, if a company does, you know, does pr processes data for five purposes, but uh, in general, but in relation to you, they only do that for one purpose. They shouldn't just repeat the five purposes in your access request. They should verify what exactly they do with concretely your, your, your data and, and give you a copy of that data as well. There's a question here. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to embarrass myself because I, I, f I can never pronounce the name of your organization. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's, uh, it's tricky. Yeah, but you, you published this um, great schemata about uh, different types of data that we should have access to, and, and particularly inference data. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about um, what inference data subject uh, subjects are able to access or should have the right to access, uh, and where that where that line is drawn. Uh, as proprietary information for um, for the company. Uh, in my case, it it's relates to Uber. Uh, I know that they profile um, drivers. I know they attach electronic tags to their profiles based on their uh, performance. They deny they deny that, but at any rate, I guess it's inference data. And and I would like to have your opinion about where is the line between proprietary company information the types of inference data that uh, particularly workers but other vulnerable subjects ha must insist on the right to have access to. Thanks. <coughs> so to give you a little bit more, more context, the, 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 the infographic, we, we, created, we um, created some kind of infographic that presents three levels of your online profile. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the, the first level is uh, what you yourself actively put into for to, to the data controller. So for example, when you provide your name, when you provide your email and so on. The second layer is observations about you. So for example, when did you log in, what time did you log in, where you were, and so on. And the third layer, so the inferences, are what conclusions, what, what assumptions about you were made based on these two levels of data. And so we are very indeed interested in this third layer of data because we feel this is where, this is, you know, what everybody really cares about. Um, there's this know-how about people, how they work, what they're really interested in, not what they declare they are interested in, but what they're activity um, or, or how they behave uh, on, on your on your example for example how uh, you know you can declare how much time you work for example but then uber will uh, find a, a better way than trusting you because they can trust data about you and so it's an, an a de definitely a difficult um, difficult difficult question of where you draw a line in my view as lo it is your personal data and it should be you should have access to it. As, as we uh, mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning of that panel, personal data is a very broad concept, and as long as it can be linked to you, it is your personal data, and it should be given to you. And yes, in, in fact, in, in Article 15, there is um, a provision that says that uh, <coughs> when this infringes on other people's rights, including intellectual property, for example, that this access can be restricted in some way. But I... I personally don't don't know how to how to draw that line. 
Um, we see that argument uh, very often. Actually, we, we, we are in a legal battle with one company who said that they, they will just not show us our profile data because this is their intellectual property, because it shows how they categorize people, it shows their know-how of how they do their marketing campaigns. Uh, I believe it should be given to, to, to the individual, but uh, what are your thoughts? Is there any a case law on this? Um, as I am aware, there is no high level or like high courts uh, case law on this, but it is a question that is buzzing around the room all the time. Um, I, I think if I, if I look, especially again, go back a bit to the history of the right of access and why we have it, um, I think it's extremely important that the argument be made that it's absolutely clear from that history that the intent of creating this law was to give access to data in particular in this kind of cases. I mean, I would say almost say that the case that you, that you just described is almost, is like, is, it could be a textbook example of how it would be unfair for, for a company to have a profile on you and you not being able to have insight to that profile but because without that insight, you have no way to contest uh, that and it's having a direct effect on, on your life. Um, so, so I think it, 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 uh, that, that, that to me it seems that from the history of the law uh, the answer is kind of clear or should be clear but I don't think that from a legal concrete legal perspective at the moment the answer is yet clear and it really is something that will meet, need to be fought uh, in court. Yes, exactly. This is typically the area where, you know, it's the type of question that on the enforcement will inform us whether, you know, what is the ideal solution to that matter. And so that's why we're still waiting and waiting and waiting, but hopefully decisions will come out soon. Yeah, maybe but just to add a little bit on that. So I agree with what was said before uh, on this and, and um, the scoring itself, like, so we, there, Interestingly, we of course often have different sources by knowing that there is actually scoring going on. No, so there may be a lot of pressure on companies like social media companies, for for instance, to do all sorts of stuff with respect to harmful speech on their platforms. You know, and they are then uh, in the end end up in discussions how they deal with these kind of things, and then it becomes quite clear that one of the ways in which like social media companies can deal with the risks of harmful uh, content on their platforms is to develop all sorts of scoring algorithms that are like applied to what the behavior of people on their platforms. And that becomes directly, of course, very interesting to know because it implicates your freedom of expression and your opportunities to socially engage. And, um, and I think in the Uber context and other contexts, there are similar reasons that we know, I mean, in the in the in the in the Uber context, the uh, uh, safety uh, of passenger safety is a huge uh, issue in p public policy debates. So there's quite a lot of pressure on companies to develop all sorts of sophisticated ways uh, to manage the risk of of, uh, of of passenger safety. So I think that's one really good start. But once you know that there is a particular type of scoring going on, I think the legal argument partly like what feeds into the scoring, you know, is personal data. So then the second question is, is the particular scoring itself also personal data? There, there's some disagreement also be between legal scholars, but like I said uh, before, I, I'm personally in the camp that it's really quite clear that the personal data concept is very, very broad. You know, it applies to just a, a vast amount of data that relates to you, that is also applied to you, that is used to evaluate you, um, that has implications for, for you. And so I don't think legally it's that hard. It's of course much harder to get courts to accept it because it does get a little bit complicated also technically speaking. So it's very important to develop very good cases you know, that courts can decide on and that data protection authorities can decide on. And, and just to mention like because it's been the enforcement issue has come up a number of times. 
um, there's been there's a very clear-cut case coming out of academic research and civil society and journalist activity around access rights that compliance is really bad with this right. It's a fundamental right. It is in the charter. It's the clearest uh, right that is in the GDPR. So there's quite a bit of pressure on the data protection authorities to do something about it and to come with guidance, like to deliver guidance. There was a meeting in November, I think, in the beginning of November. Uh, Rene can maybe say more about that where um, uh, the European Data Protection Board invited uh, stakeholders um, to uh, to come and speak about like yeah what what should this uh, what should this look like in uh, I think on the guidance what should it look like and and so hopefully there will be uh, more cl more clarity but there's definitely a lot of room I think for civil society to push on this guidance actually delivering on like what the law says. Okay, we have one more question there. I was just wondering, um, mostly you've been discussing about companies and their responsibilities. I work on elections, I'm a consultant, and I just wondered about the responsibilities of political parties and also whether you know of any studies that have been done or successful examples of coordinated campaigns, especially related to personal data being used for digital political advertising. Yes, actually we have uh, another project. We, we, we res research political micro-targeting uh, at Panopticon in the context of Polish elections. Um, but we are more at the moment looking at the role of Facebook in all of that. But I know that there are also people who are looking at the, the role of political parties because very in, in the Polish context at least, political parties don't know much about people. They rely on Facebook on doing the job of targeting, targeting information, but for example, in the British context, it's way more sophisticated. Uh, I heard of, um, I'm, I'm not the best person to speak about that because obviously I'm not from, from the UK, but uh, Open Rights Group has been, has been working on that and Who Targets Me have been working on that. And they saw, for example, that you know, political parties were collecting information about people through some surveys, surveys that were not really, you know, um, um, about elections, but there were just random not random surveys about where to put, I don't know, police patrols in their streets, but they were reusing that information to target us to them on Facebook. So there are all sorts of like really um, sophisticated stuff going on, not in my country, but in other countries for sure, and I think that Open Rights Group is uh, doing, um, uh, oh, there is someone from, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> So um, th these requests, as you know, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you know, they take a while to get responses, so we haven't uh, got a ton of information yet. But it was sort of a two-part campaign. Uh, uh, this alludes to some of the points you made, but basically, um, in the context of the election, when we were getting people to to do these requests, um, to do these requests, our supporters, that was sort of the you could call it like the um, awareness and deterrent f uh, phase of the campaign where. Um, we tried to get a lot of press coverage just so the parties knew that we were, um, that we were, were you know, investigating. So that would hopefully have, so, um, you know, potentially mitigate some of their tactics during the actual campaign. Uh, and then now we've moved into the sort of um, research phase uh, now that the campaign's over and we're in the um, process of very carefully requesting people's um, results and getting their consent and making sure the data is transferred safely for those who are interested in, in, in sharing their responses with us. And that's gonna take a while. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've just barely started to collect that information and we'll be interested to see how it d develops. We did it in a very nonpartisan way. We did it so that um, the tool that we built was that it went to all the parties uh, at the same time. Uh, so people, if they wanted to, they could, they could go and petition one each, but if they're using our tool, we didn't want it to be weaponized in a political way and used to disproportionately hit certain parties. So we did that in sort of a, a non a nonpartisan way, best we could. And I'll just quickly do a self-promotion. If you're interested in that topic and if you're going to CPDP, we are going to have a panel on political micro-targeting on Thursday. 
So, like, and but I will give you the f uh, floor. So, uh, we are um, reaching the time of the panel, one minute. So, I'm I'm actually going to uh, give a final opportunity for some some last words uh, for the panelists, and then we will close. Um, Great, thank you. Um, thanks also to the audience for the, the many questions. Yes, uh, I, I wanted to end, end on one very negative and very, one very positive note. Uh, to start with the negative one, I think that one thing is very clear to me at least, which that is that enforcement is lacking in, in a way that I would like to really research in itself, like how is this possible? Because the GDPR is complicated, there is no doubt about that, and we have heard some questions in this discussion about complicated issues. But even when a, uh, a data controller does not respond at all, often the response of data protection authorities is silence, is nothing. And of course, that, that I compare that, let, let's say that we, we change the maximum speed on the highway, and the police will just you know, give fines to one person a day. What, what would happen then? Do we then expect to all, everyone nonetheless uh, the, the, like ad adhere to the law? No, we don't. So why would we expect with this low level of enforcement that data controllers would, would adhere? So that's one thing. On the other hand, and going back to the case that I alluded to before, so there was this, this court case um, against uh, insurance companies in the Netherlands, and one of the arguments that the insurance companies made was, well, if we give access to this data, data subjects are going to use that data against us in court, and that's unfair. That's not what the right of access is meant for. And interestingly, and luckily, the court, and this was the, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, said, well, actually, two things. There is no, there is, it's not true that the right is not meant for that. Uh, the, the right can definitely be used against you, and there's no intrinsic non-logic uh, to that. So, th so that's, I think, uh, good, and I think you see that uh, replicated. So basically, that the right is a right per se. You, you just have the right to, uh, to access, you don't have to argue it in a certain data protection related question, you can just use it. Uh, so that's great, and I hope that we will see that replicated in cases like Uber, uh, and then if enforcement is also picking up in speed, then we, we might actually get somewhere. Yeah, basically I can just say, say that, that we are still, ha there are still a lot of questions, but there's no doubt that this, this is a great tool for activism and not only for privacy related activism, but for yeah, political activism, for labor rights, for justice, for discrimination. I would encourage everybody to use it because the more we use it, the more companies are used to, 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 to dealing with access requests, the more people are used to, 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 to sending them. And I think uh, that it will create a positive like wave that will uh, push things forward. Exactly, thank you very much for being here. Um, one last word I would add is, you know, it's like I was saying, it's an essential right in the way that it opens the door to the exercise of many other rights. And we cannot emphasize enough that controllers must facilitate the exercise of data subject rights. I think that's, that's probably my main takeaway from today is that, you know, we're exercising that right and, and, and companies have to help us obtain the answers that we are entitled to. So I'm hoping for more enforcement in the future. Me too, and, uh, and on that note, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for this uh, great discussion. Mm -hmm.